Okay, um, we'll go ahead and finish blood vessels today then. I, the first semester that I taught, I talked about my daughter all the time, right? Because I was like just sitting here at home and like we want to see a picture, so I put a picture of her on here. And then like a couple years later, I'm like, I gotta update it. So then I added that one, like her fifth birthday, I think. And then this year I just added this one from last time. Okay, so that's my baby. The funny thing, she's actually like on the potty in this picture. <laughs> so like you can hit any moms, you can see like her shirt buzzes, she's like, what mom? But I just thought her little eyes and her crazy bedtime, I just woke up here was the cutest thing ever. So. It's my little baby, that's Abby. Just don't show her when she's a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> right? introducing the blood vessels, right? And we went through, you know, that we've got arteries, like elastic arteries, muscular arteries, arterioles. Then we get to capillaries. After capillaries, we get to veins, right? And we said we've got venules, medium veins, and large veins. We talked about a couple different types of capillaries, um, continuous capillaries, fenestrate capillaries, sinusoids, um, and we talked about arterial blood pressure. Right, so like the pressure in the arteries is the arterial blood pressure, what we normally just say blood pressure. And we have um, systolic and diastolic, right? Systolic is the high number during systole, diastolic is the low number during diastole. Um, we talked about hypertension versus hypotension, right? We talked about um, calculating the mean arterial pressure, so that's using one value for pressure in the arteries instead of the diastolic and um, systolic. So now we're gonna kind of go continue with our discussion of pressures, but we're gonna talk about venous pressure for a little bit. So we'll go through some of the specifics with venous pressure, and then the whole like last part of the lecture, we'll talk about all the different pressures that exist in the capillaries and why they matter and how we change them and all of that. Okay, so you kind of have direction on where we're headed. So. Remember that venous return is the amount of blood that's returning to the right atrium each minute. So literally, the amount of blood returning to the heart in the veins. And we need for the venous return to be pretty close to the cardiac output, right? Most of the blood that we pump out should make its way back to the heart if we want the circuit to keep going, if we don't want to run out of blood. So we have to look at how do we make that happen, right? How do we make sure that we get all of this blood back up to the heart via the veins? Remember when we talked about the veins, we said that there is a relatively low um, effective pressure in them. Okay, the effective pressure is just the pressure difference. Remember we said that the total pressure is not very important, it's the change in pressure that's important. So the change in pressure in the venous system is relatively low. It's about 16 millimeters of mercury. And so we have like our heart, our arteries, <coughs> our capillaries, and then our veins. When we look at the venous system, the pressure down here at the venules, so at the very end of the capillary bed, is about 18 millimeters of mercury. When we look up at the vena cava, it's like gone. There's practically nothing left. Um, it's about two millimeters of mercury. So you see the difference there, the change in pressure from the venules all the way back up to the heart is about 16. That's a really low effective pressure. That's not a very big pressure difference or a very big gradient um, pushing that blood forward. When we look at the arterial system, it's about 65 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so six, the, the change in pressure, the delta P over here is 65 versus 16. So you can see this is like, remember we looked at hills and we were like, okay, which one is steeper? And we said that the steepness is more important than the total height. So the steepness over here is it's much steeper. That's a much bigger change in pressure, pushing the blood down to the capillaries. Um, the venous pressure going back up to the heart is not very great. Um, however, when we looked at the speed of blood flow, right? remember we said that blood goes, um, it's coming really fast out of the arteries, but then it gets slower, 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 and then it goes really, really slow in the capillaries. And then what happens to the speed of blood flow as we head back towards the heart? It increases. Right, so again, we said that that seems so weird. Like there's low pressure. How is it that the blood's speeding up? That it's going faster and faster and faster and faster. And we said that the reason for that was because the, the velocity of blood flow or the speed that the blood is flowing um, has to do with the diameter of the vessels and the total cross-sectional area. 
Remember, as the vessels get bigger and bigger and bigger, the blood can go faster and faster and faster through them, just like the roads. Right? When you go from your neighborhood on State Road 70, you go faster. When you go from State Road 70 onto the interstate, now you go even faster. Okay, so you drive fastest on the biggest roads. The blood flows fastest through the biggest vessels. So even though we have a very low effective pressure in the veins, the blood still starts to flow faster and faster as it heads back to the heart, as the veins get larger and larger and larger. It's kind of our basis of where we're at right now. Is that all okay? Okay. So with such a low effective pressure, how in the heck do we get the blood back to the heart? This is really a quite an amazing feat. Um, if you think about it, there's very, very low pressure and we're bringing that blood all the way from the big toe back up through the entire body against gravity most of the time and back into the heart with barely any pressure pushing it forward. Okay, so we need some ways to help this. Um, and we have two different mechanisms that we utilize to help increase venous return or to help um, kind of push that blood along to make sure that it makes it back through the veins um, and into the heart. We already talked about the first one here, the muscular compression and one-way valves that are present in the deep veins of our legs. Remember we said that <clears throat> in our deep veins in our legs, every so often the tunica intima, which is what layer? The inner layer, right? The tunica intima or interna is the inner layer it will fold in and it'll make the little one-way valve like that in a vein. And we said that we have muscles that surround the veins. And when the muscle contracts, okay, when the muscle's contracting, it expands like that and it squeezes the vein. When it squeezes it, it pushes the blood up forward this way. But remember, the blood can't go down the opposite direction because these are one-way valves. They only allow the blood to go up back towards the heart. When the muscle relaxes, it can't drop back down further than this valve because the valve shuts. Right? So every time your muscles contract, even tiny little contractions that you don't realize are occurring, um, but every time the muscles in your legs contract, they help to push that blood more and more and more up your limbs into your abdominal or your uh, abdominal pelvic cavity. Uh, and these one-way valves help make sure the blood doesn't drop back down the wrong way. The other way that we help um, kind of enhance venous return is via what we call the respiratory pump. You're gonna have to kind of take my word on some of this because we haven't had respiratory yet. We'll talk a lot about like changing the volume of the cavity, how that changes pressure and how air flows and so you kind of just go with me a little for right now, just believe me. Um, I'll explain how it all happens when we do respiratory. But just kind of in general, if you picture the torso like this. Okay, so this is your diaphragm. Okay, this is the diaphragm. It's this huge dome-shaped muscle that completely separates the thoracic cavity from the abdominal pelvic cavity. That diaphragm is what makes you breathe. It's the most important thing for breathing. It contracts or goes down and then up, down and then up, and that's how you inhale and then exhale. Inhale and then exhale. And it all has to do with changing the pressure in the cavities. Remember, volume and pressure are related to each other, right? Inversely. If you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure which makes sense, right? Like if I have a balloon here and I squish it really, really, really hard, I'm making it really pressurized in there, right? As you squish something, you increase the pressure. So we change the volume in order to change the pressure to breathe. This also happens to affect the vessels that are in here because the vessels are also in an area that you can change the pressure. So this is the, the thoracic cavity up here, right? With your lungs and your heart. This is the abdominal pelvic cavity. When you inhale, when you want to pull air in, the diaphragm contracts and moves down. So if this diaphragm is now in that position, look what we've done to the abdominal pelvic cavity. We've squished it, right? We've made the volume smaller. So everything down here is under more pressure and squished. So that pushes the blood that are in these vessels forwards towards the thoracic cavity. 
Okay, then we need to exhale. We need to push the air out. So the diaphragm goes back up to that position. As the diaphragm comes up here, now we've increased the pressure up here in the thoracic cavity. And all that blood we just put forward there gets pushed forward into the heart. Okay, so think of it almost like, you could think of it like suction or like a pump that every time you breathe in, you're making the blood go to the thoracic cavity, from the thoracic cavity into the heart. Okay, from the abdominal to the thoracic, from the thoracic into the heart. So it's every respiration, it sucks the blood up and pushes it into the heart. Um, is that okay? Okay, so if the one-way valves and muscular compression help us get up the legs, then the respiratory pump helps us get um, through the torso and back up into the heart. Both of those help, um, help out with the pressure since the pressure is relatively low in the veins. Okay, so finally we get to capillary pressure. 